Welcome to chapter 7, part 3. Uh, this is the last of the three parts of chapter 7. Uh, in part 1, we introduce the skeletal system as well as the two major divisions of the skeleton. Uh, and then we started by uh, introducing the skull. Part 2, uh, we finished up the axial skeleton by talking about the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. In this lecture, part three, uh, we will finish up the skeleton by talking about the appendicular skeleton, so the bones of the upper and lower limbs, as well as the pectoral and pelvic girdles. In addition to the axial skeleton, the appendicular skeleton is the other major division of the skeleton. Uh, the appendicular skeleton will include all of the bones found in the upper and lower limbs, as well as the girdles. Uh, we have two different girdles in the body, and both of them are responsible for attaching the upper and lower limbs to the axial skeleton. The pectoral girdle, if you know where your pectoral muscles are, it's your chest, uh, the pectoral girdle is responsible for attaching the upper limbs to the body trunk or to the axial skeleton. And the pelvic girdle, if you can imagine where the pelvis is, um, functions to attach the lower limbs uh, to the axial skeleton or to the body trunk as well. We'll first get into the pectoral girdle um, and then from there talk about the upper limb. But first, the pectoral girdle, as we have just seen, um, attaches the upper limb to the axial skeleton. The pectoral girdle, also known as the shoulder girdle, includes the, the left and right clavicle, also known as the collarbone, and the left and right scapula, uh, which is formerly known as your shoulder blade. All of those bones together, in addition to attaching the upper limb to the body, they also provide attachment sites for many muscles um, that function to move the upper limb. Something to take away uh, from the rest of this slide is the fact that the scapula actually have no direct attachment to the axial skeleton. They definitely don't attach to the skull. Um, they do appear to be um, up against the thoracic cage. However, there is no bone to bone connection. Um, and this is gray, and we see this translated into the movement at the shoulder joint. Um, our shoulder joints are highly mobile, um, but they are also more susceptible to injury due to lack of stability. Similar with the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage, we will introduce each bone, uh, starting with the bones that comprise the pectoral girdle, and then moving into special bone markings found on each of these bones. Uh, so let's start with the clavicle. Again, we have a left and a right clavicle, also known as the collarbones. All you need to take away from the clavicle is the fact that it has two ends. Uh, you need to know what these ends articulate with, uh, but the more medial end appears to be more blunt and rounded. This is the sternal end. The sternal end of the clavicle will articulate with the manubrium of the sternum. The opposite end, moving laterally now or away from the midline, we find a more flattened end known as the acromial end. The acromial end will articulate with the acromion process, which is found on the scapula. We can see two joints here being formed. On the medial aspect, we find the sternoclavicular joint. And on the lateral aspect, we find the acromioclavicular joint. Moving to the other bone that helps to form the pectoral girdle, we have the left and right scapula, um, which you may have referred to them as shoulder blades prior to this course. However, the scapula are classified as flat bones, um, and they are found on the posterior aspect of the rib cage. So if you were to reach around and hug yourself, you would palpate your scapula. Each scapula will have three borders, um, superior, so towards the top. The medial border faces the vertebral column, 
and the lateral border faces towards the armpit or the axillary region. Where each of those borders meets each other, so at three points, we now have three angles. The superior border occurs between the superior border and the medial border. The lateral angle occurs between the lateral border and the superior border. The inferior angle occurs between the lateral border and the medial border. We will see these in just a couple of slides. Here is your list of bone markings. Um, while you should be able to identify them on a blank image of a scapula, you should also know a little bit about each of them and you should be able to describe their location on the bone. Uh, so we'll start with the spine and you can actually palpate this on yourself. Um, the spine of the scapula is a very prominent ridge on the posterior side. The acromion now is sort of at the top of your shoulder. Uh, for some people it's fairly bony, but it is easily palpated. The acromion on the scapula is what articulates with the acromial end on the clavicle to form the AC joint. The coracoid process, coracoid means beak, um, is an anterior projection and we will actually be able to identify three different muscles that attach to that bone marking. We have the biceps brachii, the coracobrachialis, and the pectoralis minor muscles. The suprascapular notch will be a groove taken out of the top of the scapula, as its name suggests. And then we have several depressions, and they are really named um, based on their, their position on the bone or in relation to the spine. Supraspinous fossa, above the spine. Infraspinous fossa, below the spine. Subscapular fossa is found on the anterior side of the scapula, right up against the rib cage. And then lastly, the glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity serves as the socket in the ball and socket joint that is the shoulder joint. Let's start by looking at uh, the posterior aspect of the scapula, and we can start by identifying the three borders and the three angles. First, we have the superior border, so this is towards the head. And this is a right scapula, so found on the right side of the body. The arm would be over here, towards this direction. This is the superior border. The superior border meets the medial border at the superior angle. The medial border meets the lateral border at the inferior angle. And lastly, the lateral border meets the superior border at the lateral angle. From there, we are able to jump into our list of bone markings. Uh, be sure you are able to tell the difference between a scapula looking at it from the posterior side, seen on the left side, but also be able to identify a scapula looking at the anterior aspect, seen on the right side of the slide. First, we have the suprascapular notch, a groove out of the top of the scapula. From there, we will have the spine. If you follow the spine out laterally, it eventually flattens to form the acromion, also known as the acromion process. On the anterior side, we are able to identify the coracoid process. From there, we can find our three fossa or three depressions. The supraspinous fossa is above the spine. There's a nice depression here. Below the spine, we find the infraspinous fossa. On the anterior side of the scapula, so smushed up against the thoracic cage, this is the subscapular fossa. Sub because it is on the deep side of the scapula in the body. Lastly, facing out laterally, we have this depression known as the glenoid cavity, which you can see here in the middle image. We will see that the bone of the arm articulates with the glenoid cavity to form the shoulder joint that is also known as a ball and socket joint. Moving away from the pectoral girdle now and into the upper limb, 
there are approximately 30 bones found in each upper limb, so 60 total. Um, there's one in the arm. Uh, again, the arm is shoulder to elbow in this case. That bone is known as the humerus. Next, we have the forearm, elbow to wrist. There are two bones there, the radius and the ulna. And lastly, in the entire hand, we have eight bones in the wrist known as carpal bones. In the palm, we have five metacarpal bones. And making up the fingers, we have 14 phalanges. Starting with the bone of the arm, it is known as the humerus. Uh, the humerus is a classic example of a long bone. Uh, here on the slide, I have provided a list of bone markings for you. Uh, you should be able to identify them on a blank image, but more importantly, you need to understand where they are located on the bone. Be sure to use directional terms like proximal, distal, medial, and lateral. Uh, found on the humerus, we have the head, but you will see that we have a head on the radius and a head on the ulna and a head on the femur. So it's extremely important that you be as specific as possible. Um, so instead of just saying head, maybe say the head of the humerus or the humeral head. The head of the humerus is the ball that fits into the glenoid cavity to form the ball and socket joint. The head of the humerus is on the proximal end and is found medially or facing towards the midline. Just distal from the head, we have the anatomical neck. It's a slight constriction. Uh, the greater and lesser tubercles are great attachment points for the rotator cuff muscles. In between those tubercles, we have a groove known as the intertubercular groove. Just distal to that, we have another slight constriction known as the surgical neck. This is oftentimes uh, where the humerus fractures or breaks and requires surgery, hence its name. The deltoid tuberosity is found on the lateral aspect of the diaphysis. We will see um, in the next unit that the deltoid muscle attaches to the deltoid tuberosity. Next, at the very distal end, we find the trochlea and the capitulum, which will articulate with bones in the forearm, the medial and lateral epicondyles, which are great for muscle attachment, and then lastly, we have two depressions, the coronoid fossa on the anterior aspect and the olecranon fossa on the posterior aspect. Now let's find all of those bone markings on the images provided. On the left, uh, we have a zoomed out view, so you are able to see the entire humerus. On the right, we have a zoomed in view of the elbow joint, so the distal end of the humerus. You always wanna start by finding the head. No matter where the head is, that has to be medial. The head of the humerus articulates with the scapula. Just distal to the head of the humerus, so slightly further away from it, we find a uh, minor constriction known as the anatomical neck. We have two bumps here. We have the greater tubercle, which is more lateral, and the lesser tubercle. In between those two bumps, we have a groove known as the intertubercular groove or the intertubercular sulcus. Just distal to that, now we have another slight constriction known as the surgical neck. As we continue to move down uh, the diaphysis of the humerus, we find the deltoid tuberosity on the lateral aspect. Continuing down to the distal end of the bone, uh, we are able to identify the medial epicondyle, and I know that that's medial because it's on the same side of the bone as the head. On the opposite side now, we find the lateral epicondyle. Now, if we shift our view to the zoomed in image, we can find the capitulum. Any term with capitate or caput in it means round or head-like. Uh, so this is a rounded part of the bone. It's very smooth. And then just medial to that, we find the trochlea. Uh, which resembles a pulley system or something that we could hinge around. Superior to the trochlea, we find a small depression known as the coronoid fossa. And seen on the posterior aspect, switching our gears over here now, 
on the posterior aspect, we find a much deeper depression, the olecranon fossa. Continuing down the upper limb, uh, we have just concluded with the humerus. Uh, we will now talk about one of the bones in the forearm out of the two, the ulna. Now, in anatomical position, the ulna is more medial. It's on the pinky side, um, and it's going to articulate with the humerus to help form the majority of the elbow joint. Some features on the ulna that you need to be able to identify, but also understand where they are located. The olecranon process and the coronoid process, the trochlear notch, the radial notch, the head of the ulna, and the ulnar styloid process. Now before I show you an image, uh, let's talk about the radius. Again, in anatomical position, the radius is more lateral. The radius and the ulna are parallel to each other, and the radius is on the thumb side. Several different features that you need to be able to identify, but also understand where they are located. The head of the radius, the radial tuberosity, the ulnar notch, and the radial styloid process. Looking at this image on the left-hand side, uh, you are able to see both bones of the forearm. Um, these are taken from the right forearm, so the ulna is more medial, with the radius being more lateral. In the image on the right, this is a zoomed-in view of the proximal end of both bones. Um, so let's start by talking about the ulna. There is something extremely important that needs to be addressed with the ulna, and that is the head. Usually the head of a bone, whether it's the humerus, the radius, the femur, the head will usually be proximal. But the ulna is the exception to that rule in that the head of the ulna is distal. So the head of the ulna is actually towards the wrist rather than at the elbow. Moving on from that, uh, we have a couple of processes, some notches. Uh, let's look at this zoomed in view over here. This is the olecranon process. That's your elbow. When you extend or straighten your arm at the elbow, the olecranon process fits into the olecranon fossa on the humerus on the posterior side. The olecranon process is separated from the coronoid process by the trochlear notch. The trochlear notch on the ulna will rotate around the trochlea on the humerus, which is the majority of the elbow joint. The coronoid process now, when you flex the arm or you go to do a bicep curl, the coronoid process will fit into the coronoid fossa on the anterior aspect of the humerus. Now these two bones are parallel to one another in the forearm, so they do articulate. Um, and here we have a nice little notch for the radius on the ulna. That is one spot where those two bones come into contact with each other. Going back to the distal end of the ulna, you may be able to see it over here. Uh, we have a styloid process. Remember, the temporal bone in the skull also had a styloid process, but overall it's a pointy projection. Moving on to the radius now, uh, the head of the radius is nice and round. Uh, you are able to see it over here on the left hand side. Um, it's proximal as we would expect. Um, slightly distal from the radial head, we have the neck. And then we have a bump right here known as the radial tuberosity. This is an important landmark because that is where the biceps brachii muscle attaches. As we move towards the distal end of the radius, we find another styloid process, the radial styloid process. Finishing up with the upper limb, uh, we'll talk about the hand. Several different parts to the hand. We have the wrist, the palm, and the fingers. Uh, so the carpal bones are found in the wrist. There are eight of them. Two rows, four bones in each row for a total of eight. Um, they are arranged in the proximal row and a distal row from lateral to medial. So take some time with the diagram coming up uh, to identify each of these bones 
the proximal row from lateral to medial, so closer to the forearm on the thumb side, we have the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and the pisiform. Moving to the distal row now, so closer to the fingertips, starting on the thumb side again, we have the trapezium, which helps to form the saddle joint that is the thumb, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Just distal to the eight carpal bones now, we have five metacarpals that form the palm. Five metacarpals numbered one through five. The thumb is metacarpal one. The index finger is lined up with metacarpal two. The middle finger lined up with metacarpal three, so on and so forth. The last bit of the hand and the upper limb will be the phalanges or the fingers. Um, total, we have 14 phalanges. Um, the thumb only has two. The thumb or the pollux has a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. The distal phalanges are the fingertips. Digits two through five, so your index middle, ring, and pinky finger have three phalanges. They have a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, and a distal phalanx. Let's take a moment to identify all of the bones that we just discussed in the hand, starting with the eight carpal bones. I prefer an anterior view. Again, the eight bones are arranged in two rows a proximal row and a distal row, four bones in each. We will name them uh, starting with the proximal row going lateral to medial, moving to the distal row, lateral to medial. Again, lateral is on the thumb side. So my cursor right now is on the scaphoid. As we continue to move towards the pinky in the proximal row, we touch the lunate, the triquetrum, and the pisiform. Moving to the distal row now, going back to the lateral side, the trapezium, which helps to form the saddle joint with the thumb, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. From there, we run into five metacarpals that make up the palm. Metacarpal one is on the thumb, followed by two, three, four, and five. Afterwards, we hit the fingers, 14 phalanges total. Again, the thumb or the pollux only has a proximal and a distal phalanx, with the other four fingers having a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, and a distal phalanx. Now we are going to transition into the pelvic girdle and the lower. Looking at this slide, we are able to see the entire pelvic girdle uh, the rest of the vertebral column has been removed as well as the bones of the lower limb. But if you follow along with my cursor, uh, you are able to see the left coxal bone or the left hip bone and the right coxal bone or the right hip bone. Sandwiched in between the two of them on the posterior aspect is the sacrum. The sacrum uh, is that third bone involved in the pelvic girdle. Uh, so those three bones collectively will create the pelvic girdle or the hip girdle. Uh, something else to point out here will be the three bones that fuse to form the coxal bone. The ilium, which is the largest part. The pubis, think of the pubic bone. And then lastly, the ischium. When these three bones come together, they form a deep socket, which will take the head of the femur to form the hip joint. The deep socket is known as the acetabulum. From here we will talk about each bone uh, that comes together to form the coxal bone, starting with the ilium. Um, the ilium is going to be the superior half of the coxal bone, um, and this is the part of the coxal bone that will articulate with the sacrum, forming a very popular joint known as the SI joint or the sacroiliac joint. The bottom half of the coxal bone is divided in half. Um, the posterior half of the inferior part is the ischium, and then the anterior half of the inferior part 
is the pubis or the pubic bone. The left and right pubis are going to meet in the midline at a thick pad of fibrocartilage known as the pubic symphysis joint. We will continue with the same theme uh, that we have seen since the skull. Uh, you will be presented a bone with a list of bone features. Not only, only will you be expected to identify them on a diagram, uh, you should also have a brief understanding of their location on the bone. So starting with the ilium, uh, the ilium forms the superior part of the coxal bone and has many different features, but the ones seen on your screen here are the ones that you are required to know. We have the iliac crest. Again, a crest is a projection of bone. The iliac crest is easily palpated when you put your hands on your hips. We have the anterior superior iliac spine, which you may see abbreviated as the ASIS. These are the pointy hip bones on the anterior side of the body. The anterior inferior iliac spine, which can be shortened to the AIIS. We have the greater sciatic notch, which is associated with the sciatic nerve. The iliac fossa, which is a depression. On the opposite side, we also have the posterior superior iliac spine, or the PSIS, and the posterior inferior iliac spine, PIIS. This slide here is going to be a great resource for you, uh, given that it is color-coded. Um, so the ilium now is the superior half of the coxal bone in that true bone color. Uh, the inferior half is divided into two parts. The more posterior part is the ischium in purple, and the more anterior part in red is the pubis. But for now, we will simply focus on the ilium. The first thing that you should be able to identify is known as the iliac crest. Again, it is the superior ridge of bone. Uh, you can see it on both a medial view as well as on the lateral view. You could think of that as the superior most extent. If you follow that iliac crest anteriorly, you run into the ASIS as well as the AIIS. Both of these bone markings serve as important attachment points for muscles like the quadriceps and the sartorius muscle. On the opposite side, you can follow that iliac crest all the way to the posterior aspect to find the PSIS and the PIIS. Furthermore, as you continue along the posterior aspect of the ilium, you find this groove in the bone known as the greater sciatic notch. Furthermore, we have a depression on the anterior side known as the iliac fossa. There's a muscle that lives in this fossa known as the iliacus muscle. Now we will briefly look at the ischium. Again, the ischium will be the posterior inferior part of the hip bone. So you should think of this in the gluteal region. Uh, certain features that you need to be able to identify. The first is the ischial spine. Remember the greater sciatic notch on the ilium? If you follow that inferiorly, you run into this narrow bone projection, which is the ischial spine. Just inferior to that, now we have the lesser sciatic notch. Usually if there is a greater of something, there is also a lesser. Also on the ischium, we find the ischial tuberosity, which is this roughened patch of bone found on the posterior aspect. This is an important attachment point for the hamstrings. And then lastly, we have the ischial ramus. A ramus is an arm or bar-like projection of bone. The rest of the purple will be called the ischial ramus. The last bone that will fuse to form the coxal bone is known as the pubis. Again, the pubis forms the anterior and inferior part of the coxal bone. Several features that you need to be able to identify include the superior and inferior pubic rami. Again, a ramus is an arm or bar-like extension of bone. The superior one can be seen uh, along the superior aspect of the pubis, and vice versa, the inferior one is seen bumping into the ischial ramus, 
oftentimes you will see this entire portion of bone down here referred to as the ischiopubic ramus. The pubic tubercle uh, is this tiny little point on the tip of the pubis, which will serve as an attachment point for the rectus abdominis, or the abdominal muscles. The obturator foramen, so we know a foramen is an opening, so you want to be looking for a hole. The obturator foramen is right here and is also created when the pubis meets up with the ischium. And lastly, the pubic symphysis. You should note that the pubic symphysis is a joint. Um, it's made up of a pad of fibrocartilage, which is great for compression. Um, and that would be located right here where we would see both the left and the right hip bones articulate with each other. Moving on to the last bit of the appendicular skeleton, uh, we will begin to talk about the lower limb. The lower limb will include the thigh, the leg, and the foot. The thigh is hip to knee, the leg is knee to ankle, and the foot is everything distal to the ankle. Similar to the arm, there is one bone in the thigh. It is known as the femur. The femur is the largest and the strongest bone in the body, um, and the majority of our weight is transmitted through the femur. Many different features that you need to be able to identify, but again, there aren't going to be a ton of pictures presented to you on the exam, so it's very important that you are able to understand a description of the location of these features. We'll start with the head, the greater and lesser trochanters. Notice we had tubercles on the humerus. Now we have trochanters. The gluteal tuberosity, the linea aspera, the lateral and medial condyles, the lateral and medial epicondyles, the adductor tubercle, the patellar surface, and the intercondylar fossa. Something else that we will also address very briefly while we're here is the patella. We know that the patella is an example of a sesamoid bone or a short bone, but a sesamoid bone will develop and live in a tendon. The patella or the kneecap resides in the quadriceps tendon and it helps to further protect the knee joint. Now using that list provided for you on the previous slide, uh, we'll go ahead and identify all of the bone markings on the femur. The femur on the left is an anterior view, so from the front of the body, and the femur on the right is a posterior view. Both bones are found on the right side of the body. We'll start with the head. Again, usually the head is round, it's on the proximal end of the bone, and it faces medially. The head of the femur is seen here. Uh, it's nice and round to fit into that acetabulum to form the hip joint. Um, just distal to the head, uh, we have the neck, but more importantly now we are able to see the greater and lesser trochanters. Continuing down the posterior side now, we run into the gluteal tuberosity. It is this rough patch which allows for the attachment of the gluteus maximus muscle. The gluteal tuberosity eventually runs into this line known as the linea aspera. Uh, we will see many different muscles have an attachment on that bone marking in particular. Continuing down, now we find two rounded protrusions. Those are going to be the condyles. The condyle on the same side of the bone as the head is the medial condyle. On the opposite side now, we find the lateral condyle. The epicondyles will be the most, mostly on the edge of the bone. So the lateral epicondyle is even further out than the lateral condyle. And the medial epicondyle is even further out on the edge than the medial condyle. The condyles, both medial and lateral, are what articulate with the tibia to form the knee joint. A couple more things on the femur. We have the adductor tubercle. The adductor tubercle is an extremely important landmark. It is found just above the medial epicondyle and it is only on the medial surface. We will see that there is a muscle 
in the medial thigh that attaches to this bone marking. While still looking at the posterior view, uh, in between the medial and lateral condyles, we find the intercondylar fossa, or the depression between the condyles. And lastly, jumping back to the anterior side, there's this nice, smooth surface on the distal end known as the patellar surface, which is where the patella, or the kneecap, glides over during knee flexion and extension. Moving distally down the lower limb, uh, we reach the leg. Again, the leg is knee to ankle. Similar to the forearm, uh, the leg also contains two bones that are parallel to each other, the, the tibia, which is more medial, and the fibula, which is more lateral. The tibia is the weight-bearing bone of the leg. The fibula plays no part in bearing weight. The fibula has absolutely no attachment to the femur. We do see several muscles in the lateral leg attached to the fibula, but for the most part, you could think of the fibula as it's there for moral support. On this slide, you will find your list of bone features for both bones in the leg. Again, uh, this view is of a right leg. The tibia is much bigger and more medial compared to the fibula. Seen on the tibia, we will have medial and lateral condyles. These will articulate or join up with the femoral condyles to form the knee joint. In between the medial and lateral condyles now, we have these bumps. That is the intercondylar eminence. Continuing down the anterior aspect of the tibia, we find a bump, and you can actually palpate this on yourself. This is the tibial tuberosity, where we will see the quadriceps muscles insert. And lastly, if you go all the way down to the distal end of the tibia, we have a bony projection known as the medial malleolus. Again, if there's a medial, there's usually a lateral. However, you only see the medial malleolus on the tibia. And this is actually your ankle bone on the inside of your ankle. Moving over to the fibula now, the fibula has two ends. The more proximal end is the fibular head, or the head of the fibula, which articulates with the tibia. And the distal end now, found on the outside of your ankle, is the lateral malleolus. Here we have a zoomed in view of the proximal part of the tibia. On the left is an anterior view and on the right is a posterior view. You are able to see again the medial and lateral condyles, the intercondylar eminence, and most importantly the tibial tuberosity. We will finish up chapter 7 part 3 of 3. Uh, by finishing up the appendicular skeleton and talking about the foot. Again, the foot is everything from the ankle down to the ground. Uh, it includes tarsal bones, metatarsal bones, and phalanges. These are not to be confused with the bones in the hand. Again, the bones in the hand were carpal bones and metacarpal bones. Looking at the ankle or the tarsal region, we have seven tarsal bones, the calcaneus, the talus, the cuboid, navicular, and the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform. Similar to the metacarpals in the palm, the metatarsals form the majority of the foot. And they are also numbered one through five, starting from the big toe or the hallux and working your way laterally towards the little toe. Same in the hand, we have 14 phalanges in the foot. The big toe or the hallux has two phalanges, a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. Digits two through five have three phalanges, a proximal phalanx, middle, and distal phalanx.
On this slide, now we get a superior view, a lateral view, and a medial view of the foot. Uh, be sure you are able to identify all seven tarsal bones from all of the views, as well as the five metatarsals and the 14 phalanges. But let's start with the tarsal bones. Um, if you did not know this, the calcaneus is actually your heel bone. When you walk around and the, your heel strikes the floor, that is the calcaneus. Sitting on top of the calcaneus, we have the talus. The talus sits nicely in between the medial malleolus on the tibia and the lateral malleolus on the fibula. Just anterior to the talus, we find the navicular, more so on the medial aspect of the foot. From there, we have a row of four bones. We have the three cuneiforms um, in order based on their name. We have the medial cuneiform, intermediate, lateral cuneiform. Finishing that row, we have the cuboid for a total of seven tarsal bones. Five metatarsals numbered one through five, starting with the big toe, and 14 phalanges, two in the hallux and three for the other four toes. Again, this was chapter seven, part three, uh, where we took care of the appendicular skeleton. We addressed the pectoral and the pelvic girdles, as well as all of the bones of the upper and lower limbs.